welcome you this morning as we gather in God's presence to worship him, uh, to give our praise and thanksgiving uh, to our Lord and Savior, uh, Jesus Christ. Today is a, a special Sunday, and that Ascension Day is just a few days from now, and so we're going to think in a, and emphasize in a special way the Ascension of Jesus and the good news that he reigns as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. A welcome if you're visiting with us today. We're glad that you're here. Uh, we hope that you feel at home as you worship with us and, uh, and are able to, to also join us in some time of fellowship after our worship uh, service this morning downstairs in uh, our fellowship hall. Well, as we enter God's presence, the words of Psalm 24 invite us. Let's stand together as we receive these words. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. And this God greets us as we gather in his presence with these words, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And let's continue to bring praise to our God as we sing together your name.
seated. But we give thanks that the ascended and reigning Jesus is also the one who intercedes for us, uh, and that when we come before God honestly, acknowledging the ways that we have fallen short, that he grants us his grace and his forgiveness. And let's again turn to him uh, in a prayer of confession uh, and renewal. Well, holy God, we groan at our weaknesses, and we ask forgiveness. Your word is so clear, and your grace is so good. But we close our ears to your call. But like your servant, Paul, we know what you require of us, and yet, like Paul, what we do is not the good we want to do, and the evil we do not want to do, that evil we keep on doing. We mistreat those we love, and we dishonor you, the one who made us. How long, O oh Lord, will we continue to ignore your will? Yet you provide streams of living mercy. You invite us again and again to live renewed lives, so we turn once again to the cross, to the stone rolled away, to our interceding Lord Jesus Christ, seated at your right hand, to the gracious gift of your Spirit. And we pray these things in the strong and powerful name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Our song of forgiveness and grace is, I will offer up my life, will remain seated uh, as we sing together. and girls, if you want to come join me up at the front, I have something that I want to share with you this morning before you head down. Hello. So first, a question for you. Uh, how many of you have been on a boat? Okay, so, all right, good. Now, is there somebody that's willing to tell me what sort of a boat you've been on? You can just say it out loud. A canoe? Like a canoe? Not a kayak, okay. All right, anyone been on anything bigger than that? Yeah? Um, I've been on, uh, like, one that you would paddle. 
Okay. Yeah. Good. On a motorboat, okay, that's bigger, yeah. Okay. So many years ago, uh, before I was married and before I had children, I got invited to go on a sailing trip on quite a large boat. It was a big enough sailing boat that there was actually a, like a kitchen down below and a place to sleep. And we had to sail across some open waters. And on the way there, everything was great. And we put our anchor down and we had a really nice meal and a beautiful place. On the way back, it wasn't as great. It was so wavy and windy. And for a, a few minutes, I was asked to steer the boat, which is kind of scary, because I don't know anything about sailing a boat. And uh, the captain was actually up on the very front of the boat, and the boat was doing this, and we were worried he was going to get thrown into the water. Um, probably the most scared I've ever been out, out on the water. And then something amazing happened. We saw something. I took a, we saw this. Do you know what that is? A yeah, it's a kind of a dolphin, yeah. We're not sure if it was a dolphin or a porpoise, but the kind of dolphin that swims in the more northern waters that are not as cold. And do you know what? We didn't see just one. We saw like five of them. And as we were sailing along, they started doing this, coming up out of the water, following the boat for a while. And I know for me, when I was scared, it was kind of a reminder in God's creation of how good he is, and uh, I have to say that after I got back to land, I said, I'm never going on a sailing trip again, that's for sure, but I was also thankful that God kept me safe. We're going to hear a story um, in today's scripture, you might have noticed the banner, there's the Apostle Paul, he's in prison, uh, Paul has, in our reading today, he's been in prison, and then he gets loaded onto a boat, and he goes through this huge storm, and it's so scary, and it's not just like a few hours, it's like two weeks of storminess and God preserves them. And uh, I know that you boys and girls are going to have times where life is hard and challenges come, and that God, um, I'm sure that God, or God promises that he's also with us in the midst of those times. So let's pray to him as you get ready to head down, okay? Lord, thank you for these boys and girls. Thank you for your goodness for them. Thank you for the way that through them we see um, your goodness for us. Bless them as they learn more about you. And uh, Help them as they navigate life, all the challenges and the joys uh, that come with it, that you would continue to remind them of your promises for them, that you are a source of security and care, no matter what comes their way. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's say the words of blessing together, shall we? Okay. Have a safe trip down the stairs. Sure, yeah. That is so cool. Beautiful. Have a safe trip down, okay? Don't get dizzy. Okay. All right. Um, can somebody get me an easel? I'm going to just draw the pictures. It'll be like a version of Pictionary where you have to guess. Ah, that's fine. This happens. Uh, we're going to spend some time uh, in prayer. And um, let's uh, ask God. Let's come to God. Almighty God, we give thanks that you have exalted your son Jesus to the highest place and have given him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. We glorify you, Lord Jesus, that you are the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. And for the joy set before you, you endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Help us to keep our eyes fixed on you as we run the race that is before us. Well, on this Ascension Sunday, we give thanks that you are truly one of us, and yet also the one who rules over all things, that even now you continue to pour out your Holy Spirit into our lives, and we in turn bring our hopes, our needs, and our desires to you. We pray for our world at a time when ongoing concerns leave us feeling uncertain about what the future holds. 
We pray for peace to come to lands where there is war, for food to be made available where there is hunger, and for justice in places where there is oppression. The news stories of our day fill our thoughts, the ongoing conflict in Ukraine, the sharp increase in the cost of living, especially as it relates to food, housing, and fuel, and the loss of innocent life at a grocery store in Buffalo, New York. We pray for an end to the conflict in Ukraine and for healing for those who have lost so much, for provisions for those especially affected by high rates of inflation, and for both comfort and justice for those who have lost loved ones in Buffalo this past week. We pray for your church. We remember our sister congregation, All Nations, CRC, in Halifax, and we give thanks uh, for young adults there who are becoming involved in life uh, and and the mission of that congregation. We pray for those who have become disconnected uh, from that fellowship during the pandemic, that you would draw them back into worship and fellowship. We pray and and give thanks for the seniors at All Nations and for the meaningful contributions they make to that congregation and also for their deacons as they create new ways to connect with the community of Halifax. We also pray for and give thanks for this congregation. We thank you for this uh, long weekend where some of us have been able to to go away and enjoy maybe a a weekend of camping or just some time away with friends or family. Uh, We think of the youth of our congregation and the YP group that uh, has that is spending the weekend on PEI for a rally there, that that would be a a meaningful time of them connecting with each other, but also connecting with you. And and we acknowledge um, the pressures and the anxieties that are faced by youth in our world today, uh, the uncertainty that they've experienced over over these last couple of years of pandemic. And, And we pray that even as they reflect on some of these things and ways of coping, that you would again reassure them of being the one who truly cares for them and that they would turn to you as a source of security and a place of peace uh, when they are struggling. Lord, we give thanks for this time of the year when spring growth and warmer temperatures provide new energy. And we give thanks for the much needed rain that fell this past week and again, the gift of rain that fell last night for many of us. We pray for those uh, in our midst who are struggling Remember those who live with chronic pain and other forms of ongoing illness, asking that you would sustain and strengthen them, especially at times when when pain flares up and they're feeling discouraged. We pray for Pam Pott as she continues to wait for a surgery date and receives care in the hospital, that you would grant her patience and a special measure of your grace at this time. We thank you for your generosity in our lives and ask that you would bless the gifts and offerings that are received for the ministry of this congregation and for your kingdom. Hear our prayers, Lord, and accept our praises. And we ask that they would be like sweet-smelling incense that comes from our lives and rises into your presence as an offering to you. And so, Lord, we pray these things, and we ask them in Jesus' name. Amen. I think that um, most of us know the words of Spirit of the Living God by heart. I wonder if maybe um, we can still sing that together. We'll stand as we sing. Um, And maybe it's possible for someone to uh, do a little bit of photocopying of the two songs remaining and get those handed out. Is that possible? I'll just leave it to you to figure out. Oh, is it working again? (laughs) Oh, the back one. Oh, yeah, okay. Well, we can all turn around, too. That's fine. <laughs> so we're going to quickly reorganize the sanctuary with the pulpit. Okay. Well, let's stand and sing. I'll, I'll let you figure out what you need to do. Or, yeah.
us one in heart and mind. Make us one in love. Humble, caring, selfless, sharing, spirit of the living God, fill our lives with love. seated. Coming up here to uh, read the scripture reminds me of an uh, evening service some years ago. And I started off and George said, uh, that's the wrong scripture reading. So I flipped through and started again. He says, it's still wrong. <laughs> After I fumbled my way through it, I was coming down and Roger looked up and he gave me the old thumbs up like finally I made it. So. I guess, Eric, in, in, in your dad's memory, if I adrift, I'd appreciate getting me back on track. The scripture this evening is from, or this afternoon, is uh, this morning. <laughs> All right, I've had my three boo-boos. <laughs> it's from Acts 27. And you can find that on page 908 in your pew Bibles, starting at verse 27, the shipwreck. On the 14th night, we were still being driven across the Adriatic Sea. When about midnight, the sailors sensed they were approaching land. They took soundings and found that the water was 120 feet deep. A short time later, they took soundings again and found that it was 90 feet deep. Fearing that we'd be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. In that attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors let down the lifeboat into the sea, pretending that they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. Then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it drift away. Just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, you have been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you to take some food. You need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from your head. After he said this, he took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of them all. Then he broke it and began to eat. They were all encouraged and ate some food themselves, although there was 276 of us on board. When they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. When daylight came, they did not recognize the land but they saw a bay with a sandy beach. If they, excuse me, where they decided they would run the ship aground if they could. Cutting loose the anchors, they left them in the sea and at the same time untied the ropes that held the rudders. Then they hoisted the foresail to the wind and made for the beach. But the ship struck a sandbar and ran aground. The bow stuck fast and would not move, and the stern was broken to pieces by the pounding surf. The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners to prevent them from swimming away and escaping, but the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life, and he kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get the land. The rest were to get there on planks or other pieces of the ship 
In this way, everyone would reach the land safely. So far the reading of his word. Thank you, Tex. To give a little bit of context to our message this morning, uh, we've been making our way through the story, which is a condensed and chronological version of uh, scripture. Um, Got all these beautiful banners that have uh, been made, one for each week. And uh, today we're at our second last, uh, second last, I guess, chapter of the story. And next week we'll uh, conclude with our look at the book of Revelation. I do have a PowerPoint, but I'm I'm not going to suggest that you turn around and, um, you know, look every time it changes. So, Eric, just so you know, okay, yeah, or Jerry, sorry, Jerry's the one who kind of controls these things. Perfect. Well, brothers and sisters in Christ, Christian author Jill Briscoe recounts her terrifying experience as a six-year-old living in England during World War II. That one night, air raid sirens woke the family as they were sleeping. They quickly got out of bed and took refuge in a nearby bomb shelter. Huddled underground with family and neighbors, uh, she could hear the drone of enemy planes overhead. It was the most frightened that she'd ever been. Well, not knowing where to turn, she directed her thoughts to the only source of comfort that she knew, uh, the Church of England Catechism. Well, her parents were nominal Christians. They rarely attended worship. But like most boys and girls growing up in 1940s England, she had learned the catechism. And as Jill listened and heard the bombs dropping outside, she began to pray with all of her might the only words of faith and hope that she knew. Well, included in the Anglican catechism are the words of the Apostles' Creed. And these are the words that she began to pray. I believe in God the Father, Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. I believe in the Holy Spirit. And as she made it to the third and final part of the creed, something remarkable happened. At that moment, she recalls the Holy Ghost slowed down my heart, and I knew that everything was going to be all right that her intense fear was transformed into a deep and abiding peace. Well, in Acts 27, we catch up with the Apostle Paul as he faces a harrowing experience of his own. He's aboard a ship en route to Rome when it is swept up in a massive storm. It is a terrifying two weeks for all who are aboard. Roman soldiers, prisoners, and the ship's crew So how does Paul respond? Does he shake his fist at God and give up his faith? Does he panic and try to secure his own safety ahead of the others? Does he regret ever becoming a missionary of the gospel? We discover that even when faced with the prospect of death, Paul continues to share the gospel. He responds out of a peace that transcends all understanding. Well, stories like this resonate with us today because we too may face frightening circumstances. Uh, these can question, they can cause us to question God's abiding presence in our lives. Well, how can we be sure that everything is going to be all right? Well, by the time that we arrive at today's Bible reading from Acts 27, Paul has already traveled many dangerous miles by land and by sea, that he has faced hardship, imprisonment, and persecution, that over the course of ten years, Paul makes three missionary journeys throughout the world of his day. But then after his third journey, he returns to Jerusalem. This time he is fully accepted and gladly received by the church there, except now there are new enemies who conspire against Paul. 
on the day that Paul speaks freely about Jesus in Jerusalem, a violent mob takes him and drags him to the edge of the city. And behind these actions is a group of Jews who are hostile to the gospel message. They have heard about Paul's exploits throughout the empire. They are eager to permanently silence him. Well, Paul is saved in the nick of time by a fast-acting Roman commander. He takes Paul into custody before any harm can come to him. And even though the local Roman governor knows that Paul is innocent, he keeps him locked away in prison for political purposes. He does it as a favor to those who conspired to kill him. And it's only after two years in prison does Paul finally stand trial. But because of his close proximity to Jerusalem, Paul is concerned about getting a fair trial. Enemies who seek to pervert justice are all around, and so Paul uses his rights as a Roman citizen to make his appeal to the highest source of justice in the land. Paul appeals to Caesar, the emperor of the Roman world. And all of this sets in motion what takes place next, that Paul must travel to Rome to stand trial for his faith in Jesus. Well, Paul is loaded onto a ship it will begin the long journey to Rome. Along the way, he's placed in the custody of a Roman centurion, a man named Julius. And Julius is described as a good man that Julius allows Paul to visit with his friends along the way, and these friends provide for Paul. They offer him encouragement and care. And it's an uneventful voyage as they make their way up the coast from Caesarea to Sidon and then across to Myra. And at Myra, they transfer to a new ship, a grain hauler that is bound for Italy, and it will drop them close to their final destination, Rome. And as summer turns into fall, Paul knows from his years of traveling experience that the good weather for sailing is quickly coming to an end, that apart from the ship's crew, he is likely the most experienced passenger on board. Over the course of his missionary journeys, it's estimated that Paul travels more than 5,000 kilometers by sea. Well, after a challenging journey from Myra to Fair Havens on the island of Crete, the ship's captain has to make a difficult decision. That by now, it's already the end of September. The storm season is fast approaching. The weather is becoming unpredictable. It's a time for all ships to find safe harbor for the winter. But the captain has his sights on getting just a little bit further, on reaching Phoenix, just a short distance down the coast of the island of Crete. That Phoenix has a better winter harbor than Fair Havens. Getting to Phoenix will position them well to set out the following spring. And Paul expresses his concern, but his words go unheeded by the captain. And instead, the captain gives the command to hoist the sails. With the coastline of Crete in view and the wind at their back, they are on their way. And at first, the weather is perfect. It says that a gentle south wind began to blow. They seize the moment, and they make the final push for their winter harbor. But just as quickly, everything changes. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster swept down from the island. Well, living in New Brunswick for these nearly four years, I've learned about the formidable weather system known as the Nor'easter. And I'm amazed at how a day of blue skies and sunshine can so quickly give way to a violent storm. Unlike Paul's day, we generally know when storms are coming. We take precautions to remain safe. But now imagine being on the open sea and suddenly having this massive storm slam into your boat. Well, the book of Acts provides a vivid description of the severity of the storm. The ship is battered. It's driven further out into the open ocean. The coastline of the island of Crete disappears from sight. The captain and the crew have little recourse but to drop the sea anchor and hope for the best. 
and the ship is buffeted so badly that it threatens to break apart in the middle of the Mediterranean. Ropes are passed under the ship to give it more strength, to hold it together. Cargo is tossed overboard to lighten the load. As the storm maintains intensity for many days without relief, the resolve of the passengers begins to wear thin. They start to give up any hope of being saved, except for one lone passenger, a prisoner named Paul. And to the others on board, Paul is just that, a prisoner, a man on his way to stand trial. And though he's important enough to have his own personal guard, even Julius, the centurion, does not grasp the extent to which God has used Paul to build his church. Neither did Julius understand the unique perspective that Paul brought to their plight on the open waters. But growing up in a Jewish home, Paul learned that the sea was a place that was full of chaos. In the story of creation, God separates the water from the dry land. Well, dry land was a place of safety, a place to establish homes and communities. But the sea was unpredictable. It was dangerous. Those who traveled its waters did so at their own risk. So what was on Paul's mind as he endured this monstrous northeaster? I wonder if the words of Psalm 107 came to mind for him, where it says that some went out on the sea in ships. They were merchants on the mighty waters. They saw the works of the Lord, his wonderful deeds in the deep. For he spoke and stirred up a tempest that lifted high the waves. They mounted up to the heavens and went down to the depths. In their peril, their courage melted away. Well, this theme of the sea's power and its unpredictability is highlighted throughout the story of Scripture. In Genesis, God uses the power of rising floodwaters to wash evil away from the earth. But it's only Noah and his family and a remnant of the animals that are preserved from the waters that cover the face of the earth. Well, many years later, Jonah, the prophet of God, flees from the Lord when he is called to preach repentance to the city of Nineveh. Jonah climbs aboard a ship going in the opposite direction, and the Lord hurls a great storm after Jonah. And in desperation, the sailors aboard the ship throw this wayward prophet overboard And immediately the sea grows calm. And as Jonah descends down, down, down to a watery grave, the Lord sends a great fish to swallow Jonah and to preserve his life. Well, the same theme of God's care in the watery chaos continues in the New Testament. Remember when the disciples get caught in in a sudden storm on the Sea of Galilee, That Jesus wakes up from a deep sleep and he rebukes the wind and the waves and the sea grows completely calm. And in the same way, the Apostle Paul, he knew the terror of the sea. But he also knew the one and put his trust in the one who is mighty to save. Well, as the ship is driven along, as all hope seems lost, Paul takes action. He speaks words of encouragement to the occupants of the battered boat. I urge you, he says, to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. How does Paul maintain his confidence in such trying circumstances? Well, it's because Paul's courage is not rooted in the frailty of his circumstances, but in the character of God. And God has promised to use Paul as an instrument of the gospel to all nations, and there is still work to be done. What gave Paul this confidence? Well, John Stott explains that Paul believed in God, in his character and covenant, and was convinced that God would keep his promises. 
Well, today God continues to reveal his character and his promises to us. He speaks it through words of scripture and the work of the Holy Spirit. We come from a tradition that is deeply rooted in God's covenant promises. He puts his claim on us through baptism. That at the table of the Lord's Supper, God confirms in our lives his promise to redeem us, to never forsake us. So what might it mean for you to lean more fully into these promises? What fears or challenges are keeping you from resting in the certainty of his redemption? After the ship is tossed about for 14 days, something changes. The crew senses that they're approaching land. They use a plumb line to measure the depth, and it's true, the ocean floor is rapidly becoming shallower. The anchors are dropped. Some of the ship's crew seize the moment, and, to try, and they try to escape in the only available lifeboat. And Paul warns them that unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. And there's this scene where the soldiers cut the ropes holding the lifeboat, and they let it drift away. And again, Paul invites trust in God's promises. I mean, what a moment it must have been for everyone on board to watch the one and only means of salvation float away. But even by this action, Paul encourages us to shift our hope away from trusting in our own efforts to trusting in God's saving work. Well, it's only human nature to try and rescue ourselves from difficult situations. And sometimes God provides open doors that lead to freedom and relief, and we should walk through them. But often he calls us to cease in our efforts and instead to prayerfully place our lives in his hands. Well, Paul's final call to his fellow shipmates is to eat. It is to regain their strength. For the last 14 days, says Paul, you have been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. And then with the ship about to hit land at any moment, Paul leads them in a simple meal. It says that he took some bread and he gave thanks to God in front of them all. And then he broke it and he began to eat. Well, this sounds so familiar, doesn't it? Where have we heard this before? On Luke 24, Jesus travels with two of his disciples on the road to Emmaus. And though their hearts burn within them, they are unable to recognize the Savior until Jesus takes bread and he breaks it in their presence. Only then are their eyes opened. And now here in the midst of a stormy sea, with the boat about to crash on a shore that may well be full of sharp rocks. We sense the presence of the risen Lord Jesus among this frightened group of more than 270 people. And if Jesus shows up in this way among a distressed group of travelers and prisoners and sailors, well, then we can be confident that he will do the same in our midst. That he won't abandon us so that we can fend for ourselves. And that's because he is the God who is with us. And isn't that the heart of the gospel, that the God of heaven descends to earth to become one of us? He experiences for himself both the joy and the sorrow of human life, That even today, on this Ascension Sunday, we hold tightly to the hope that a resurrected, bodily Jesus is in heaven. He prays for us in the presence of his Father. He pours out the Holy Spirit in our lives to sustain 
and to encourage us along the way. The story ends with the confirmation that everything that Paul has said comes true. When the ship runs aground onto a sandbar, it begins to break apart. Those who can swim are instructed to reach the safety of land. Those who can't have to hold on to anything that floats. And miraculously, they all survive. That with the ship disintegrating in the surf, every single person is accounted for. And what a feeling it must have been to stand on the shore after so many days of danger on the open sea, of not knowing if you would live or if you would die. And what a God who rescues them from what seemed to be certain death. So how does this story detailing Paul's final days invite us to grow in our commitment as followers of Jesus. Well, Paul models a courage that is rooted in God's promises. His confidence is based on the character of God, a God who is Lord of all, even in the midst of chaos. That the story of Acts 27 invites us to renew our trust in the God who is present, even in the midst of a storm. What storms are brewing in your life right now? And how might you renew your trust in his promises as the one who is Lord of heaven and earth? And this doesn't mean that we minimize the challenges that we face in life, but rather that we maximize our view of the one who promises to be present with us at all times. And this first response leads to a second. That as we live in the confidence of God's care in our lives, we become witnesses to our world. Will Williman asks, what is the response of the church in the midst of discouragement and fear? He says that like Paul, the church takes bread blesses it, breaks it, and begins to eat. What good will that do, the world may ask? Well, in this sign of hope, in the power and presence of God, this witness to our confidence in God's will to give us what we need, even in the midst of the storm, the church not only nourishes itself, witnesses to the whole world. Well, some of the greatest testaments to our faith can happen when hardship comes our way. Well, that's when the power of the cross shines the brightest. Those who don't know the Lord are often amazed at the way that followers of Jesus can go on in life with hope and with joy even after they have endured serious illness the breakdown of a significant relationship, and even death. So how is God inviting you to receive his promises anew in your life and to renew your trust in him? Well, as you do, may you experience the presence of the God who extends his promises, who redeems your life through the good news of the cross, and who even now pours out the Holy Spirit on his people. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for this dramatic story captured in the closing chapters of Acts Well, Lord, this is a story that resonates with us as we live in a a world that at times feels like it is so full of chaos. Sometimes it is the chaos without the stories that we see taking place in the news and the world at large that leave us feeling 
insecure. Sometimes it's the chaos within, the challenges and stresses and anxieties that we face in our own life, the hardships and difficulties, whether that's a, a struggle with our own health, whether that's hurt that we're feeling in relationships, whether it's the grief of losses that we have experienced but yet continue to mourn. And Lord, we give thanks that you are the God who in the world at large, but also in the specific circumstances of our lives, has promised to be with us. So you invite us, Lord, to deepen our trust in you. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would continue to encourage and to challenge us to do that more fully. And that as we put our trust in you, and as you show yourself faithful, that others too would see and experience the wonder of who you are and what you have done. And so we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now that I've had a chance to catch my breath, it's great that all of our songs this morning remaining are in the red hymnal. We're going to sing together, Here I Am, Lord, uh, 869, and we're going to stand together as we sing.
Our final song today will be 947, uh, We Receive Your Blessing. I'll give you a moment to look that up. And then I will leave you uh, with a blessing from our God. Well, God sends us with these words of blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and grant you his peace. Amen. Thank you.